Today's question of the week and next week's question of the week are tightly integrated. Um, but we're going to tackle them as two separate questions because I think that it's important to give each identity, which seems to be a theme over these past three weeks is you know bisexuality and then these two identities coming up. I think it's important to give each identity its own spotlight. Mm -hmm. So today's question is what makes an ethical dominant? Ooh, fun. An ethical dominant. So that's interesting because I consider myself an ethical sadist. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to think that I'm ethical uh, and as a dominant as well. For me, now, this isn't me answering the question generally. This is saying for me, um, what makes me ethical is that I have a code that I will not break. So, for example, as a sadist, I am an ethical sadist. Yes, I do enjoy the inflicting of pain. I don't just randomly inflict pain on people um, who don't want it, don't consent to it, and wouldn't necessarily enjoy it or enjoy something about it. So for me, it's got to be consensual. I can't just walk around beating people or hitting them with single tails and get a blast out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Because um, as I often tell people, I will cause pain, I will hurt, I don't harm. Um, so for me, a, an ethical code uh, or a code that I won't break, lines that I will not cross, boundaries that I've set for myself and rules for my behavior is what makes me ethical. Um, when things start crossing over into abuse, which as we know is totally non-consensual, that's where I think kind of the difference becomes. So um, I feel like people who may even, even within, because in kink, what we do is we push the limits, right? We're always pushing the limits, going to what some people may call extremes, going beyond certain boundaries. And yet we still have boundaries, you know, no matter, even in a TPE, you know, total power exchange, you've still got lines you won't cross. And that for me is what um, ethics uh, um, uh, means and what having an ethical code. Means. It's funny because I was just doing a bunch, bunch of ethics training for my insurance license. But yeah, that that's that's for me what that means is that if you've got lines that you won't cross uh, and they're hard lines that stop short of abuse, then um, that makes you an ethical person, um, in my opinion. So you said something that I think is interesting, mm. and I'd like to touch on that. Do you feel? that abuse is by definition non-consensual? Can someone consent to their abuse? No. And the reason is because for me, the definition of abuse, yeah, is, is that it is non-consensual. Abuse for me is any attempt to either force someone's behavior or inflict some sort of um, discomfort or harm on somebody against their consent and will. And mm -hmm. so therefore, uh, in my opinion, abuse is always the, uh, uh, the antithesis of consent. Uh, okay. Because if you're consent, like, you know, I may have a masochistic bottom who wants the living crap beat out of her, who wants to be bruised on a regular basis, wants to be bitten, wants to be sore, wants to be grabbed by the hair, dragged around, face slapped and made to crawl. You know, that's not abuse if that's what she wants and I'm giving her what she wants and, you know, they have consented to it. It's not abuse. Abuse is, you know, listen, this is my hard limit. This is my trigger. Please don't do that. And that's the thing you do because it's fun to fuck with the one thing somebody doesn't like. Okay. That's abuse because you've crossed the line that they've specifically asked you not to cross. So in my opinion, yeah, I don't know how you abuse somebody with their consent. Um, you know, and that's, but it actually has to be their consent. And in my opinion, because of the way I teach consent, it needs to be their expressed consent. And it needs to be clearly expressed and it needs to be enthusiastically consented to. Um, so, yeah, just like I don't think, you know, like we talk about consensual non consent, which mm -hmm. is kind of a funny phrase to me because I understand it is a form of play. It's a form of play that I enjoy. But by definition, consensual non consent is not non consensual. Right. It is. I want you to do this. That seems like it's against my will at a time I'm not expecting. But these are the things that I want you to do. We're actually going to have a negotiation. You don't negotiate the lack of consent later on. It's just you're negotiating to this is what I'm OK with. 
and things like that. So there's a little bit of play there, but you know, the way I play as a dom, the submissives that I engage with always have a voice, they always have autonomy, and they always have the right to call the scene. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, abuse is different. Abuse is you have no rights. You're basically the thing I'm going to take out, whatever it is that's in me on. Um, and it's completely against your will and was never negotiated. Also, I don't know how you negotiate abuse. So what if somebody and, and Martha asked a question that I'm going to, to bring up here in a minute as well. What if somebody consents to, nay, is even enthusiastic about requesting or about um, initiating or instigating harm to themselves. Okay. Harm as in like? Doing something that is going to mentally or physically scar them in traumatic ways or putting themselves in situations and consenting to them that ends up giving them, you know, long-term issues or um, and the people that then participate yeah. in that. Me, if I were the one playing, again, I don't negotiate forms of harm. Again, I will hurt, uh, I won't harm. Uh, to me, injury is a problem. You know, if there's mm -hmm. permanent scarring out, you know, outside of something that's survivable, livable, you know, when we start getting into the realm of things that are mental or physical health threatening, um, I've got problems with that because at a minimum, it possibly points to somebody having a pathology mm -hmm. um, that probably needs to be looked at. You know, if it's, you know, listen, I'm a self harmer, I'm a self cutter, I want you to sit here and um, make me cut myself. It's like, you know, knife play I'm okay with. You know, like I said, I do cell popping, I do micro branding, stuff like that. Again, if it's mm -hmm. negotiated. You know, but this, you know, I give you leave to throw me up against the wall, break my arm and carve your initials into my back with a Bowie knife. Yeah. Uh, that's I mean, the, the other thing to recall, too, is at a certain point, you start running up against not just ethical issues, but legal issues, too. I mean, that can very much be mm -hmm. considered violent assault, not to mention the fact that much of what we do as kinky people can be considered violent assault. One of my f uh, mm -hmm. favorite people who speaks on this topic about the law when, in regards to kink always says that, you know, BDSM, bondage and discipline is kidnapping <laughs> and sadomasochism is assault and battery. I mean, you've got to be careful with this stuff. So if you start crossing lines, if you start doing what's considered serious injury or harm to someone, most states have laws that allow the state to protect people from that level of harm. And we'll even flat out say you can't consent to that level of harm. Um, so I, I think when we're doing serious injury, you know, if, if it's, Hey, I like being punched in the face repeatedly, particularly in the back of the head. Well, yeah, you could do brain damage to somebody. If you punch them full face, full force in the face enough times, that's probably a bit much, you know, that really is, um, um, you know, I think that's problematic and I would definitely say unethical, you know, if, if we're really pushing that close to serious permanent physical, mental, or emotional harm, that is a challenge, especially if someone didn't specifically say they want that. If they do want that, I say that the onus is on the top to say, all right, wait a minute, hold on. You know, if mm -hmm. somebody in a place that's saying, listen, I need you to do this to me, it's going to hurt me, it's going to tear me up, but that's what I want. I, you know, I'm not the one for you. I'm not here to harm. <laughs> you know, I, I almost take a Hippocratic oath as an ethical t top and say this, that there's certain things that I'm not going to do. Um, and that's not what we get into a connection for is to do harm to one another. So, so Martha asks, what if I'm not sure that the masochist, and we'll, we'll say that this applies to submissive and bottom and whatever, if somebody else's consent, what if I'm not sure if it comes from a good state of mind? Then opt out. It's mm -hmm. a, I, I mean, I don't know if Martha's heard the way that I teach consent, but my whole thing is that um, there's certain pillars to consent. And if you're concerned about that person's state of mind when they give consent, don't trust it and don't accept it. Because here's the thing, if you have misgivings about their state of mind when they consent, then I'm arguing that you don't really have their consent. And you know, when negotiations are going down, two people have 
um, the onus in the negotiations or rather two parties or however many parties are involved in the negotiation. And if you're the top negotiating with a masochist who consents to something that maybe you're not sure about, but you aren't comfortable with their state of mind, you have every right to say, you know, I don't think I'm going to do that. I, I, I can't be sure about your state of mind. You can either continue to negotiate and discuss until you feel better about it, but you've got every right not to go through with it. There's this sort of belief that if the bottom consents to it, then it's the onus is on the top to go for it. And the answer is no, you don't, because you don't have to be the one that does it. If, if, if they're consenting to, listen, I want you to tie me down, you know, blindfolded and gag, stick me in a car going full speed out of a brick wall, you can say, no, I don't think I'm going to do that one. You can agree to yeah. not be a party to whatever sort of harm they want to do. And I firmly believe that if you're not sure about their state of mind, you have every right and almost an obligation to opt out. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. I'll, I'll agree with that. And then how to measure possible mental health harm? Uh, you don't know. Uh, you know, unless you're a mental health professional, it's kind of really hard to know. And even then, unless you know that person, a lot of it has to do with the connection you build. Um, but I would say this, if it's a newer connection, opt err on the side of caution and err on, mm -hmm. on the side of consent, caution and lack of harm. The deeper you get into and getting to know somebody, you can start asking something things. If I'm with somebody that I know has a mental illness, are you on your medication? Are you intoxicated? Are you in any way inebriated such that you will not be willing or not be able to voluntarily consent without any form of coercion, including lack of medication, some sort of mental health issue and stuff like that? Uh, I'm not saying that you should sit there and ask them, did you go to therapy this week or anything? But you have the right to gauge that. And again, if you're not sure, don't freaking do it. The, the stakes mm -hmm. are too high. If you guess, well, they seem like they're all right. Sure, let's go for that really wild and crazy thing that included, you know, swinging from a trapeze bar and landing in a pit of glass or something. You know, maybe not because, you know, again, error on the side of caution. Everyone involved has the right to negotiate. And if you're dealing with somebody who is already predisposed to kind of tell caution to go fuck itself, maybe you should be the one to say, hey, maybe I'm the stopgap measure that's like, how about we tone down the extreme level and let's just swing on the trapeze with a net underneath? How about that? OK, that way, because the stakes are so high, you know, mm -hmm. if you're talking about really doing forms of damage that can do permanent, you know, physical or mental harm, if you could seriously injure somebody, uh, if you're not sure, don't do it. That's the whole key to this is not having a misunderstanding or a mistake happen. That, that's the way I go about teaching consent. It, it, there are too many bad things that can happen very severely if we just let caution go to the wind when it comes to being consensual about various interactions. And if you're not sure, please don't. Right. Right. And um, fitness is talking about how your responses are quote unquote complicating choice, but in the same way that um, different types of interventions do in the sense that you have um, a lot of different pathways that you can think through, um, you know, what are your reasons? What are your thought processes? What, how did you come to this conclusion versus other conclusions and options that are available to you? Mm -hmm. um, so ethics, mm -hmm. um, I, I have a definition for ethics that I'd like to share just to throw it out there for everybody. For and it. that is ethics are a set of moral principles that guide a person's behavior. Morals are often shaped by social norms, cultural practices, and religious influences. Mm -hmm. Ethics reflect beliefs about what is right, what is wrong, what is just and unjust, what is good and what is bad in terms of human behavior, and serve as a compass to direct how people should behave towards each other and understand and fulfill their obligations to society and live their lives. So with all of that stated, somebody who is ethical by definition is simply somebody who lives by their own set of morals or by their own personal code. It does not mean 
and this is a kicker, that there is some sort of universal ethical charter that we can all subscribe to and look up things. Like, for example, some people say, well, you know, I live by the law, except that's not really ethical necessarily in all cases. It's not right in all cases. Um, and it's also not true in a lot of cases because most people will break the law whenever they feel it's appropriate, like mm -hmm. speeding or, um, I don't know, jaywalking, you know, maybe doing a California stop at the stop sign. You know, there's a lot of ways, a buggery in certain counties, you know, having anal sex is breaking the law. If you're in kink, you're probably breaking the law. So I think it's critical to understand that when we talk about ethical non-monogamy or ethical dominance, we are not talking about a set of guiding behaviors that everyone can agree to. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, moving forward, I think an ethical dominant is somebody who, as a dominant, let's also talk about what a dominant is, somebody who is willing and able to lead within their relationship. Okay. So an ethical dominant to me is somebody who can and will explain to you how they think about things. And then they live their life and they lead that relationship consistently with the way that they speak. Yeah, right. Yeah, because ethics are individual. And it's, you know, like I said, I have an ethical code, which, mm -hmm. you know, sounds like a Hippocratic Oath in so far as that, you know, I won't do harm. Uh, and not everybody necessarily has that. You know, they may only do harm under certain situations and stuff. Um, yeah, and you mentioned, you know, somebody that says, well, you know, I live by the law, that, you know, the law itself can be unethical. Um, mm -hmm. The law can be wrong. Uh, you know, it's the, at one point in this country, you know, in the United States, it was illegal for people who were of different skin colors or races to marry. That mm -hmm. law had to eventually be struck down. Um, the law you mentioned about buggery was actually overturned in, um, by the Supreme Court. You know, sodomy laws were stricken because they were considered a violation of the, you know, equal um, uh, protection clause of the Constitution. But it took i think it was 2003 before that actually happened for a long time yeah yeah i mean it was you know it was a long time yeah that was actually a, a, a texas case that, that that struck that down and so yeah you know there's a lot of this of course we're talking about in many cases civil disobedience where just because it's legal doesn't mean it's ethical you know you know martin luther king was in a jail writing to people from birmingham because what he was doing was ethical even though it was illegal <laughs> you know, he was in jail for not obeying uh, what he felt was an unjust law. And there's always that discussion about how, you know, disobeying an unjust law is actually the ethical and even um, right choice. So, yeah, what's right and what's wrong, what's ethical and what's legal are always different things or there can always be different things and they mean different things. Definitely. So, yeah, being ethical or like you said, you know, much of what we do in kink can be illegal. It, it's, you know, you can't falsely imprison somebody, you know. But if you tie somebody up, that be, could be considered false imprisonment. You know, if you start, you know, beating somebody until they bruise, that could be considered assault and battery. And if, the ironic thing is that, especially in the United States, you know, the state can step in and stop you from doing that. They can say you don't have the right to harm one of our citizens, no matter mm -hmm. whether or not they consent to it or not. That's the other thing that I don't think a lot of people realize is that in this kink stuff, you know, the law can step in and prosecute that person that you consented to taking that beating despite your consent. Um, so, yeah, and it's, I do a whole workshop about kink and the law. So that's uh, we could really go down a rabbit hole where I start spouting off case law and stuff, but uh, n not in this forum. <laughs> so. OK, so when you talked about, you know, being an ethical dominant yourself, you specifically focused in on I do not harm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have other examples of what you would consider ethical within your dominance or leadership? Um, 
I require communication so that I know something is going okay, specifically in a scene, but even outside of it. Mm -hmm. So I have been mid scene playing with somebody and what had happened was at this particular instance I'm talking about, um, they had gotten into a headspace, they'd gotten in subspace, which is fine. I don't have a problem with that, but they had not communicated to me what their subspace looks like. And so when everything is fine, we're playing in the scene and we're communicating and I'm doing my occasional check-ins to see how things are going. And then suddenly they stop communicating and I'm waiting and I'm getting no response mid scene. And it was mid impact play scene. I'm like, I'm not going to keep wailing on somebody who's not communicating with me. So I called the scene. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, uh, and the thing was, wasn't so much a problem with them not communicating. It was that I had not expected them to not communicate. If they had told me, listen, when I get into headspace, I sometimes stop talking, you know, and I was like, oh, OK, now that's different. But I didn't know that ahead of time. So when everything is fine, we're communicating and suddenly something changes and I'm just standing here in a dungeon, big black dude beating the crap out of a white woman who's tied to a cross and she's not communicating with me. I suddenly me feel very, very uncomfortable. And so my ethics are such that I called the scene. Mm -hmm. We went through aftercare, and then once she was able to communicate with me, we talked. She was like, no, I was flying. I was just in headspace. I'm like, okay, we need to renegotiate the fact that that's what's going to happen and then start checking in to see, you know, does this last for a long time? Are there other ways we can find to communicate? Or are there things you can tell me to look for when you're going to be in that space or when you become non-communicative? I had another partner who doesn't become non-communicative, but basically... <laughs> They do, but you can't understand what they're saying. Like they literally start speaking gibberish. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that means I'm flying high and eventually we'll come down out of it, you know, um, but that they are able to do something like, you know, drop a set of keys or something like that if they're hitting either a yellow or a red and some things. So it was just the lack of communication and not knowing what's going on. I won't keep swinging at somebody and potentially doing harm if I can't find out whether or not I'm doing harm. And in that situation, with the first instance I talked about, I was just doing an impact play scene and they stopped communicating with me. I don't know if I'm doing harm or not, but rather than risk potentially doing more harm, I called the scene because of my ethical code. Right. So. I think that's a good um, example. Cool. Uh, you know, for me, an ethical, the kind of ethical dominant that I am um, I, I also believe in communication. Um, and to me, that means speaking through expectations um, and then being consistent with them. So if we agree to something that I'm consistent with, you know, bringing it up, if it doesn't meet those expectations as much as giving positive feedback, if it does, meet those expectations. Um, I also believe that, like you, the dominant has a lot of power in, and fitness mentions, uh, even the most empowering kinksters can refuse to participate in what feels like harm for them. An ethical dominant, to me, will make the call when they need to. Um, they will not be badgered or bullied or chopped from the bottom into doing something that they do not feel 100% comfortable with. And um, that they will take personal responsibility for. Mm. And to go off on one of my own personal like pet rants, that means that not blaming somebody for, you know, they made me do it. They were topping from the bottom. You know, it's you I, absolutely. I can say that this person lied or betrayed me, mm -hmm. but I could not ethically give somebody else the responsibility for something that I've taken responsibility for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So it's, it's interesting. And it, I, I kind of expect that, you know, when somebody asks, what does an ethical dominant look like? People are going to say, you know, things like honesty mm. and, you know, um, consistency is probably going to be one. That's one of my favorite words when it comes to dominance. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I mean, it helps to be very consistent um, and leading and setting guidelines, but that's just leadership. You know, consistency and leadership is uh, just an, an important trait, not to mention, you know, it being part of that, you know, being ethical. Right, right. So I guess, yeah, an ethical dominance, if, if you want to know if a dominant is ethical, then to me, the easiest shorthand is, are they open and communicative about how they think and feel? And do their actions match their words? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are and the I, things for me. And I think, you know, based on your definition of ethics, if we're trying to find out if a dominant is ethical, what is their code? What, you know, find mm -hmm. out what are the lines they won't cross? You know, are there lines they won't cross? What are um, their hard limits? We, we talk a lot about like submissive and bottom hard limits, but what are the hard limits yeah. of your dominance? What, 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 what will they just not do? Um, yeah. You know, and how far is too far? How much is too much? You know, and and will they declare what their hard limits are and then keep to them? Because it's one thing to declare a limit. It's another thing, like we said, being consistently or being consistent to say, yeah, this is my limit. But OK, I'll do it a couple, a couple of times because you asked. I would think as a bottom, that would be a problem because if one limit is a gray area, then any of them are. And anybody who's heard me talk about my consent workshop knows that for me, gray areas are where misunderstandings start. And I got a problem with that. Um, so, I mean, again, because the stakes are so high, we need clearly drawn lines. And that's going to be one of them, whether it be a boundary or a rule. So, Awesome. I think we've tackled that perfectly. Cool. I like being perfect. <laughs>